views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Bronx Social Justice and Anti-Violence Forums. I'm your host, Darren Jaime. And if you're asking what this show's about, well, we try to bring you a discussion on a deeper understanding when it comes to social justice, as well as anti-violence issues, talking about the inequities that many people in the communities of color face, as well as multiple points of view, and also civic engagement. All that's right here on this show. And we wanna let you know, as you stay connected to us, we're gonna bring you some familiar faces. We're gonna bring you some new faces. We're gonna bring you some new information on the attempt to keep you better informed. Well, to be honest, this show really started taking root after the death of George Floyd. George Floyd killed by a Minneapolis police officer with a knee to the neck, sparking outrage across the nation, including protests here at home. Our very own Sanji Lopez brings us the story of a peaceful protest right here in our borough. The Bronx held a peaceful protest demanding justice for George Floyd and black lives while standing against police brutality. The protest began at 149th Street, 3rd Avenue and ended at St. Mary's Park. We're not here for the violence. We're not here to steal. We're not here to take from each other. We're here for our voice to be heard. Our job collectively is to stop our people from being killed for no reason and to stop the injustice of police walking away and going home to their children after they maim us. From Minneapolis, from Ferguson, from LA, wherever injustice is, we're gonna be. And they don't want us to be in the streets. They don't want us out here. So stop killing us. The protest comes on the heels of the termination of Minneapolis cop Derek Chauvin, who is now facing third-degree murder and manslaughter charges after a viral video surfaced of Chauvin kneeling on George Floyd's neck while Floyd pleaded for air. Protesters say the charges are not enough and demand an end to nationwide racist policing. All they can do is make an example out of this one cop and continue to murder black people. Yes. Yeah. The Bronx protesters can be heard loud and clear right around me. They stand in solidarity with nationwide protests, including the ones in Minnesota, for George Floyd. While marching, chanting, and honking, protesters headed towards the Bronx County building. The march came to an abrupt stop when the NYPD barricaded the path on Alexander Avenue and 138th Street near the 40th Precinct. <laughs> The NYPD followed marchers to St. Mary's Park where people kneeled and pacifically faced off with police. Protesters eventually shouted for the NYPD to retreat as the peaceful march came to an end here in the Bronx. Reporting for BronxNet, Sanji Lopez. And thank you, Sanji. And the debate will continue to go about protesters and their right to protest, as well as their interactions with NYPD and also across the country. As we continue, we take a look now at the protesters we talk also about rioters, and we also talk about looters. And these are all things that came up during the protest of George Floyd. But recently, George Floyd was laid to rest in Minneapolis, and one very special elected official right here in our area had the opportunity to attend. Fernando Cabrera, council member from District 14 right here in the borough of the Bronx, was the only state elected official in the House as George Floyd was laid to rest. We're pleased to be joined by Councilmember Cabrera, who joins us now here on our show. Thank you for having me. Congratulations on your first uh, program uh, tonight. Yeah, thank you. I mean, we're just trying to uh, really raise the issue and talk about social justice and social action. I think that that's really the theme of what this show is all about and really what America is talking about right now. And when we look, of course, George Floyd becomes the major catalyst for this. But I want to get your take first and foremost, because uh, you were one of those Bronx dignitaries that were present at the funeral of George Floyd in Minneapolis. First of all, how did that all come about? Well, uh, I received a personal invitation to go uh, based on people who were involved and putting it all together. I was on one of the only two 
uh, New Yorkers outside of Reverend Al Sharpton and I drove 18 hours uh, to get there. Uh, I literally drove uh, all the way there and drove back. Um, it, it, was, it was very moving, uh, Darren. Uh, it, it felt surreal. Uh, it was very painful. Uh, what you don't see in TV is uh, the people that were in the back and the sides, uh, people weeping, crying. Uh, at the same time, I felt a sense of hope, uh, like I haven't sensed in a long time. That this, this time, things can actually change. And, uh, and I feel very honored. I was the only elected official from New York State uh, or the city uh, to be able to go. And then I had the opportunity to go to where he was murdered. And there were people there from every background, race, age. Uh, it was very peaceful uh, uh, demonstrations that were taking place. And there were celebrities also that were present. Uh, they were very approachable as well. Uh, there was a sense uh, there as well that we must move forward, that change must take place, that we must break the yoke of injustice in the land because the land is sick. Yeah, yeah. And so you take that, right? You take the injustice that occurred and, 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 and we know that George Floyd, I call it murder, uh, was, was, was murdered pretty much on video for everyone to see. But I also wanna talk a little bit about bringing it back home because after, we know the protests continue to happen all across, uh, all across the United States. But particularly, let's talk about New York City for a minute. Talk to me about uh, your thought about the protests that we're seeing. And then, of course, we definitely have to get into the fact of uh, the whole social justice component in regards to the police department. And so, you know, we had had demonstrations here in the Bronx. I was uh, part of the very first one. I was the only Bronx elected official there present. Uh, it was a peaceful one that took place. As a matter of fact, uh, we, we are having another one uh, with churches uh, taking place. Uh, there was a huge one that took place over the weekend. Uh, people in the Bronx want to see change. Uh, we, we're tired of, like Reverend Al Sharp mentioned, uh, the need in our back. We can make it. We're not asking for any favors. Uh, we did have some looters, but I want people to separate the two, demonstrators with the looters. The looters is a small group of people compared to the thousands upon thousands of people who peacefully demonstrate. As a matter of fact, when the looting stopped, we saw even larger numbers of people coming out. Usually looting, what it does, it has the reverse effect, lets people come out. This weekend, we saw numbers like we have never, ever seen. As a matter of fact, it broke the record of demonstration nationwide. Darren, think about this. 50 states. When have you seen demonstration take place in 50 states across the United States? And for that matter, around the world. Because people is, people is glaring uh, what is taking place. What right. a black man, a black woman goes through. Uh, is is inconceivable from early on in, in their lives. They have to carry this weight of injustice upon their back. And and we gotta we gotta change. In terms of the what we're doing in the council, I put forth a resolution. We just had a hearing uh, this week uh, alongside with another pack, a package of bills. I, I call upon the state of New York to raise it to a level uh, chuck holes to a knee and the neck to be raised to the level of felony violent class one. So that's the serious consequences. Uh, yeah. In the city, uh, we are only able to elevate it to a misdemeanor uh, level and we're passing that bill as well. Uh, we have resolutions calling upon the uh, federal government to do the same. Also for a more clear and transparent process uh, for any police officer that is going through any type of discipline. We need clarity. We need, uh, we really need things to be open. Uh, it's kind of a very secretive process. And if there's gonna be trust, this is the greatest commodity in society is trust. And it's gonna be trust between the NYPD and the community and vice versa. 
we gotta have we have to have uh, transparency yeah let, let, let me go here because i want to talk a little bit about more about the, the 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 law in a second but i do want to go back to the protest for one second before i go back let me ask you about allies because much like the 1960s um we see that there are allies from you know the asian community uh the white community uh everybody seems to be coming together on this cause do you have a sense or do you feel like this is a little bit different than the 60s because in the 60s you had a certain contingent but based on what we saw this past weekend with everybody coming out and saying black lives matter it almost seems like a new type of movement yeah absolutely uh, if you listen to all the historians that are speaking uh, and the, you take a look back, you, you just have to see the videos as well. Most of the marches were 98% African American during the 60s. Now, I mean, it is as mixed as I have ever, ever seen from every group, every age, every ethnic group, every background, religious, non religious. I mean, you have a plethora, uh, plethora of uh, people coming forth because people are tired. This is this is not us. This is not what the majority of Americans and New Yorkers want for this nation. And so yes, and I think that's going to serve as the catalyst for change uh, all across this nation. And 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 so the allies are so important at this moment. Uh, we must put the pressure on so j justice uh, may be in the land. Yeah, yeah. And let me get to this, because you talked about laws and legislation. Uh, we know the governor has his reform legislation that's out dealing with 50A, um, and we saw what happened with that, uh, that, moving, that moving forward. But then also we talked about race baiting, right? And the race baiting, the calls, where it's considered, you know, driving while Black, or barbecuing while Black, or starbucks while Black, or being in a hotel while Black. And we understand that these are things that have happened uh, in the community and now making that a crime. Uh, your thoughts about the level of seriousness and the fact that it's now being considered to be a crime. Yeah, Darren, here, here's the sad thing. I, I want people to understand that people like myself, we, we, we have those bills uh, in the council at the state level. We were just being blocked. Let me, let me keep it real. We were being blocked. And this is why I want to thank everyone uh, for putting the pressure on. Because if it wasn't for that pressure, it would just be a bill, it would not pass into law. And so I'm glad that now we are gonna have laws that are gonna protect uh, black brothers and sisters where people make some frivolous type of call. Uh, and, and that's a form of oppression uh, for people to do such a thing. Uh, it, you got laws change culture. Law says what's right, what's wrong, what's important, what's not, what matters, what we value. And we have to value human dignity. Uh, Darren, one of the things that I'm really pushing for, and you know, I'm a pastor like yourself. Uh, one of the things I'm really pushing is that we get back a culture of honor, where we value everyone, that we understand everyone has the image of God within them. We have to respect that. Uh, we, no one is better than anybody else. We are all created equal under the eyes of God. Uh, and, and so, and, it, and the diversity, it should not be something that people should be afraid of. It should be celebrated. We should celebrate our diversity and, instead of, uh, uh, planting seeds of fear because what this is see the whole thing about racism and discrimination is driven by fear and i tell every parent who's listening right now uh, uh, no one is born a racist and and, it, and and there's a pandemic going on please do not infect your children if anything get yourself cured let's check ourselves i have to do some checking we all got to do some checking and the latino community we, I hear things sometimes that just, uh, you know, I have to put people in check when they say, oh, pelo malo, you know, good hair, bad hair, fine nose, it's, all hair is beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, every nose is beautiful. You know, we have different tastes, but they're all beautiful. They're all made by God. So 
you know, but those are the little things that we got to put in check. We got to check our heart when we elevate our group above others and becomes us versus them. And, and we're one big family at the end of the day. Yeah, let, let me get this question in here. And I mean, it's the hardball question I got to throw at you, but, you, but you're big enough to receive it. A lot of people have criticism of elected officials because pretty much it's all talk, right? People don't want to hear from elected officials these days because it doesn't seem like they're, they're minim, you know, they minimize what's going on. Recently in Washington, there were some Democrats and, 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 and lawmakers and they donned themselves in kente cloth. And, you know, some people caught some flack for that because it simply seemed like, you know, it was, it was a gesture, but... Uh, you know, talk to me a little bit about how lawmakers can actually bridge the gap and, and what can be done to come across the aisle to be more palatable to community and to the residents of the community who feel like even in this, in a matter such as social justice, in a matter such as social equality, that there seems to be just this huge disconnect also between, you know, minorities and also government. You know, you're so right. I, I think that first... People expect elected officials to be authentic, to be real, uh, and not, uh, I think people are tired of photo ops. Uh, they're looking for action. Uh, they're looking for change. And it is time for change. And we have elections coming up. That's the time where I will call upon everyone. Have someone, vote for someone who's going to do something. Uh, talk. Uh, it's, it's a good start, but it's just the beginning. Uh, and if it doesn't culminate into action and change, then it was all frugal. I have to tell you, Derek, the, but there are those who do want to uh, bring change. You know, I work with Germani Williams, a public advocate for the Cure of Violence program. We got that started because we, know, we knew that law enforcement was not enough. And we did this in the last recession, the only initiative. And, and the mayor is going to be announcing for an addition of $250,000 for the cure of violence to work with our young people, to give them employment for crew members that many of them started in the negative. And now we got to get them uh, to, to a place where they could rise up and, and be given an opportunity. I, I think that we should expect and hold our elected officials accountable uh, because they're there to represent, uh, you know, people are not there for us. We're there for people. We work for people. I always tell people, I work for you. Well, and listen, let, let me jump here real quick because I got less than a minute with you left, but I want to ask you this question. Much talk around the nation about defunding police, right? Uh, defunding the police department. Good idea, bad idea in New York City, real quick. You know, I, I think that we need to prioritize where our funding is going to go. We do need public safety. Uh, there are people from abroad who don't have the best intention. We're number one target in New York City, and we have issues still, uh, crime that still take place. But we also got to prioritize. So we're going to look at the funding and see how we can invest it in young people. Uh, we have 25% of, of the youth department, the agency, that got cut in only 1% from the NYPD we need something that is going to be equitable. And I think that's what the majority of people are asking for without compromising public safety. All righty. Well, we got to leave it there. Council Member Fernando Cabrera of District 14, thank you so much for being with us here on the Social Justice Forum. We're glad to have you with us. Thank you. And congratulations on your first show. Hey, thanks very much. Thanks. Listen, i got to keep it moving here on the show, but I want to let you know that we also want to talk about protesters. As we talked about protesters, they gathered in the Riverdale section of the Bronx recently, voicing their concerns and raising their voices in regards to Black Lives Matter. Our cameras were there, and we'll take a look right now. It's not fair, and I'm tired of the disproportionate arrests, convictions, and death. And remain diligent, dedicated, and consistent in our demands for social justice as black people and allies in what will be a never ending fight. We're actually in Bank One and Park and we're having a peaceful protest for Black Lives Matter. Um, I've lived in this community all of my life. I grew up here and, and we're really excited that we have a, such a great turnout. And this is what we need. We need togetherness and equality. 
and the people in back of me right now are actually talking about black stories and how they feel and that is very important to be an ally and to listen to what's going on because we need peace and we need justice in this country and black lives do matter we have an entire My brother approached me with an idea that we should be doing something in Riverdale because, first of all, we were born and raised here. Born and born raised, and raised in, in the, the Bronx. Riverdale in the Bronx. Riverdale, the Bronx. I think the biggest message is that it doesn't stop here and that we move forward. Moving forward, we do the work. And honestly, when I was making the sign, something that embarrassed me was I didn't know all these names. I knew like maybe like five of them. So I think that that's something that also needs to be done. We need to teach ourselves, we need to educate ourselves more, not only on what we need to do, but on the people we lost. It's the best thing we can do right now, educate now. Small, meaningful fact. So from the Bronx, Marble Hill Projects. Went to RKA here up, up in Riverdale, so kind of gave me a different experience. It's two worlds living in, 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 in close proximity. Where I'm at in public housing, any perspective to understand that the inequality we experience is, or that's talked about is super real uh, and, and it kills inside and out. We want accountability, compassion, and consistency and visibility. I've always felt Bronx pride. So today I felt it more than ever. So I wanted to be around people who grew up here, who understand the struggle here. I wanted to come and learn something. Every every protest I go to, I want to give, but I want to learn. And it was so refreshing to hear him be like, I'm from where you're from, and I understand your exact struggle. I'm from the Bronx, I am black, I understand being black and seeing police treat us this way. Yeah, I'm from Uptown Bronx, Gun Hill Road. I went to JFK right in Riverdale. You don't get to be vulnerable in your workspace. When you come around people who understand your struggle, you get to be vulnerable. You get to tell them about how you feel. I'm sad. I'm okay with saying I'm sad. I'm mad. And they understand, hey, I'm sad too, and I'm mad too. Darren Jaime here with you. I want to let you know Latino Justice is an organization that's actually working with boots on the ground to create a more just society by using the challenging rule of law to secure transformative, equitable, and accessible justice by empowering the community, as well as fostering leadership through advocacy and education. And the organization itself just recently released a narrative series that's actually discussing the way of police, prosecutors, and courts have historically targeted people of color and in particularly in the area of incarceration for our country. And joining us now to talk a little bit more about this is uh, a very, uh, very capable person, uh, one who knows a lot about this area, the President General Counsel of Latino Justice, uh, and that is Juan Cartagena, and we thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Darren, thank you for having me. Hey, listen, it's a very important conversation, and, and thank you for taking the time out to uh, hang out with us and have this conversation. But when we talk about you know, social justice, um, of course, we see the death of George Floyd, and that is one aspect of social justice, uh, the fight against police brutality. But, you know, Latino justice has had boots on the ground in a variety of different areas. So for somebody who doesn't know about Latino justice, first of all, let's talk about that. Sure, thank you. So our original name is the Puerto Rican Legal Defense and Education Fund. We were born right here in New York City uh, in 1972. When we first started opening our doors, there was very much a total exclusion of Puerto Ricans from civic life in New York City, from government jobs, from private sector jobs. Uh, Puerto Ricans in New York City were the largest number of people who have come from Latin America at that time. Like 80% of the entire city was Puerto Rican, of all the Latinos. But little by little, the, that diversity started changing, right? We started having influxes from other countries in the Caribbean, Dominican populations, of course, Colombian, Ecuadorian. You see all the diversity of the Latin American neighborhoods in the Caribbean and in Central South America, all in New York City. So when we started, this was a very narrow focus to use the law 
that allowed us to open doors with Puerto Ricans at the front and lead because Puerto Ricans had citizenship granted by Congress back in the early 1900s. And little by little, we started opening these doors. By the way, and among the doors that we opened early on was the New York City Police Department. Mm -hmm. We had to sue NYPD multiple times because they wouldn't hire Blacks and Latinos or Blacks and Puerto Ricans. Um, they had height requirements that certain people couldn't meet, especially Latino populations. They had tests that made not, had nothing to do with policing uh, that stopped people from becoming police officers or becoming sergeants. So for our early opening doors from the 72 throughout the early 80s, we were doing successful work to integrate the police department. Over time, of course, we do work in every area now. Today, we work on voting rights, immigrants' rights, uh, economic justice, that is the right of workers. We also do uh, challenging the consequence of the criminal justice system in multiple ways today in all in different parts of the country. And we still provide assistance to people who want to become lawyers. Um, and we've been doing that since 1972. Yeah. Well, talk to us about this. When you talk about taking on the NYPD, obviously, uh, we've seen recently the NYPD really fight back, saying that they're being unfairly targeted during such a time as this, particularly when we talk about these protests that have occurred. Uh, your thoughts on what you're seeing out there with regards to NYPD and the area of accountability? Okay. Two big things, right? One is accountability, which is a uh, a decade-long conversation we've been having in in communities in the African American community, in the Latino community, and anybody who knows anything about New York City, right? We could have been talking about the same issues back in the 1960s, at the height of both the Young Lords and the Black Panthers, at the height of unrest to demand equality, at the height of the the opposition to the Vietnam War, at the height of the labor movement and the boycott of grapes out in the West Coast with Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers. In that period of our history, these same episodes of outrageous police brutality were happening every day. And we could have easily had the same kind of reforms that we're talking about today. So accountability is a long process that now, because of what's happening in this country, only in the last three weeks, um, the culmination of so much outrageous violence, state-sponsored violence against Black folk, is exactly now pos positioning us to have to react, perhaps drastic changes in how we think about policing. So that's the accountability piece, and there's more to talk about that and more to figure out what that means. But also when it comes to uh, the integration of the police force, the overall history of the police force, um, in New York City and how police officers now, or I should say how their unions are saying that we're being, we're also being uh, discriminated against by, by the police, by, uh, excuse me, by government and the public. Um, well, the fact of the matter is we have, this, what's different from the 60s and today is we have video footage like multiple ways and multiple times, thousands and thousands of hours of footage showing provoking behavior by police against peaceful protesters. Now, I fully understand that policing is not an easy job. I fully understand that there are times in which there are times in which we have um, uh, opportunities to make sure we can um, address those issues. But for police officers to now claim that they're being the victims when all the video evidence is demonstrating something different, it's a pretty difficult thing for me to accept. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know a lot of conversation will continue to be had about NYPD relations and, you know, going, going back and forth between police community relations, which are very integral in order for, you know, the community to be able to be able to work. But let me ask a question I've been asking throughout the course of this show. When it comes to uh, 50A, which has uh, been submitted by the governor as part of legislation, his backing of uh, 50A, and then also the race baiting, making that uh, a charge here in New York, in, in, in New York State. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on that, and, and what do you think about the governor's uh, reform legislation? Number one, we've been in favor of the elimination, the repeal, complete repeal, not partial, complete repeal of 58 for many years. Um, I've sat, I've, I've stood alongside Gwen Carr, the mother of Eric Garner, um, talking about these issues when Pantaleo, the officer, was finally facing disciplinary charges for the first time, five years after the death of Eric Gardner. And she was able to sit in a, an administrative courtroom and listen to his testimony for the first time because he was never held to account. He was never forced to testify for what had happened. So he did. 
And her position was that 50A shields um, unnecessarily uh, police misconduct. We didn't know at the time of the killing of Eric Gardner that this particular officer had four substantiated, not complaints simple, but substantiated complaints of excessive use of force in his files and that nobody can know about it. Not you as a member of the press, Darren, no me as an attorney, nor the family of, of Mr. Gardner. So in his memory, I recently said, as recently as last week, we should definitely repeal all of 58. It looks like both houses and Albany have passed it. Now we'll see if the governor do, does so, signs it very soon and that's what we're looking forward to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, your other point was about race-based, uh, is that the use of mm -hmm. race baiting on phone, phone call to the police? Right. Yeah. By all means, uh, when, when people are using race to, to fictitiously come up with reasons to then get police involved in what is uh, just simple con engagement with people, uh, neighbors and others, um, that's an abuse of process. That's an abuse of government resources and it should be dealt with. Yeah. Because the last thing we need is for police to be more engaged in what they are. And that goes to the heart, Darren, of what you and I have already started talking about, right? We're at a point in which this, not only the city, this city, New York City has been talking about these issues about excessive policing for a long time, a long, long time. But like the rest of the country is not recognizing why do we need so many police in your face all the time? And you increase the number of engagement between police and civilians, and you still haven't fixed the problem of policing in general, then all you're doing is exacerbating the risk that something will go wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what's been happening in places like New York, in places like uh, uh, Chicago, Los Angeles, those kind of places. Well, you know, Juan, I'm, I'm probably going to date myself here, right? And, I, and you'll probably know what, when I... When <laughs> I don't I, think you're going to be more than me, man, but go ahead. <laughs> well, when, when I first, when I first uh, got behind the anchor desk at, at, at BronxNet, um, one of the major cases that I covered was that of Anthony Bias and uh, Francis Lavoti. That's and right. I do remember it was a Friday night uh, and it was a Friday night somewhere around six o'clock and Judge Gerald Scheinlin came with his came down with the verdict and said that he did find that uh, Mr. Lavoti had not given the truth. However, he did not find enough evidence for conviction and hence uh, Francis Lavoti was able to walk I look at that, and then I think mm -hmm. about Eric Garner. With any you know, the Lavoti case, bias, that's a chokehold. Garner, that's a chokehold. Now mm -hmm. we're sitting out here and we're watching uh, George Floyd, mm -hmm. and that's and that's literally watching a knee to the neck and being and, and being choked out. And so the question that I have is like, how much can we say significantly has changed when I just given you a timeline of you know just over the course of the last twenty some years? Um, you're right. Virtually nothing has changed. And that's because accountability for police misconduct of this kind of outrageous level of misconduct, complete disregard of, of, of humanity, really, complete disregard of procedures. Um, Pantaleo allegedly was operating under a system that outlawed, according to the manual, chokeholds. Uh, Chauvin out there in Minneapolis apparently put a knee to Mr. Floyd's neck, and apparently that's not authorized according to their own training man manuals. It doesn't really make a difference. At the end of the day, to change this culture, we have to change the levels of accountability. So, for example, if I'm the supervisor of a police force and one of my members has had four, not one, four substantiated cases of abuse of force against him or her, then what am I doing? Deploying this person out in the street repeatedly. Why aren't I putting a different kind of check on this kind of behavior? Two, if Pantaleo in Garner case or in Lavadi in the Anthony Baez case were forced to pay a portion of the damages, the millions of dollars that the city has had to pay to the families of both Eric Garner and to Anthony Baez's family, just a portion out of their own pension they might have a different take about how they act when it comes to the next engagement with civilians. And three, this again goes to the heart of what you just said before. You know, this is not only Lavadi was at least brought to account in a courtroom. Garner, Pantaleo and Garner, wasn't even brought to a courtroom. He was brought to an administrative court 
for discipline about whether or not he was going to lose X number of vacation days for what he did to Mr. Gardner. That was the only issue in that case. Right. So right. they are, Darren, they are places in this country. I can give you Bakersfield, California, off the top of my head. It's like ground zero for the killing of Latino unarmed men by Bakersfield police and Kern County police. They don't even bring charges in court against these police officers. There's one or two police officers in Bakersfield who have literally at their own hands killed three civilians. And they're still on the force. They don't even lose a day's pay. And the only investigation there is internal by the police department. And, and every time they conclude that the homicide was justified. So we don't even have prosecutors in parts of this country that have the skills to actually investigate these things and make sure justice is being served. Yeah. I, I need you to get, I got a little less than uh, two and a half minutes here with you, but I want to talk about decolonizing justice, that series, yes. what it means to you. So please uh, take the time to share that too. Definitely. Well, the first three or four minutes of the documentary called Bad Hombres from criminalization to excuse me, bad hombres from colonization to criminalization, is footage, raw footage of encounters with police with unarmed Latino men and women throughout the country. One of them is Francisco Cerner, the uh, grandfather who was killed in Bakersfield, California. The cops claimed he, uh, he had a gun in his hand. He had a crucifix. Um, so the Colonized Justice basically is, is, a, is a film production that we, Latino Justice that we created to continue to expand the conversation about criminal justice reform, about the punishment industry. And what we put front and center are the faces and profiles of Latinas and Latinos who have also been ensnared in different ways by the criminal justice system. So we have a documentary about the history of violence and, the, and what's called settler colonialism in this country. It goes back to the days when white folk came to this country and they had quote unquote, manifest destiny that they're gonna occupy and exterminate everybody from sea to shine and sea. And it starts from that premise, talks about the lynchings of Mexicanos throughout the Southwest, Texas, California, goes into modern day issues of gang policing, gang injunctions, the drug war, um, excessive profiling, stop and frisk. Then we have smaller six minute, five minute profiles I got a brother right here in New York City that where his name was on a gang database and what that meant to him livelihood. I got a sister in Arizona who talks about the issues of crimmigration. She was charged with an excessive drug possession charge, which then put her on a deportation fast track. And luckily she was out and still out. I got the family of Francisco Serna in I got this young man in Miami who is a Latino. The 12 years inside, and the system told him he was white and would not let him change his racial designation because in many states, Darren, they only report out who's white, who's black, and who's other. Yeah, yeah. So well, those are issues that we put a ball just to have a com conversation with communities about what do these systems also mean and why we as Latinx people in this country have to be in complete solidarity with our brothers and sisters in the African-American community to actually start dismantling this whole system and creating one that's transformative and restorative in its justice. Yeah. Well, one, we got to leave it there, but thank you so yeah. much for sharing with us. I mean, got to have you back. We'll certainly have this conversation going uh, as, as I know, and you know that you, you, you're a guy with boots on the ground, your organization with boots on the ground. There's so much uh, that's happening uh, that we can't even get it all in one segment. So we got to bring you back and okay. continue talking about it. One, uh, Cartagena from the Latino Justice. Thank you so much for being with us here. Take care. All right. Well, earlier in our show, we told you about the nonviolent protests, and Sanji brought you the story of how nonviolent protests were taking place all across the borough. But there was another situation where nonviolent protests turned violent. She brings us that story right now. On Thursday, June 4th, a group of protesters gathered in the Bronx at 149th Street, 3rd Avenue, around 6.15 p.m. They began a nonviolent march with chants and signs for police reform and against NYPD brutality. The march led down 3rd Avenue into Patterson Projects, through Willis Avenue, eventually ending up on Brown's Place and 138th Street. There, a troop of police cars lined up between 136 and Brown's Place. I was taping the march until at exactly 7.57 p.m. when this happened. Oh, 
hell no. In another angle at the same moment, hundreds of protesters can be seen getting pushed, kettled in, being beat with batons, and some even pepper sprayed. Let us go! Let us go! Bronxite Tanya Fields caught the trapping from inside. We are trapped right now. Whatever narrative is spun to you later, do not believe it. They have helicopters overhead. Before 8 o'clock, they was already out here trapping us. Hold on, hold on. Oh my God. I got gassed. I got pepper sprayed. I got straight pepper sprayed. My daughter got pepper sprayed. Now we had to beg them. I had to beg them. The protesters begged them to let me and my daughter through. In this clip filmed by a resident of Millbrook Houses, people can be seen cramped up into a circle detained on the ground through the night to be taken one by one into NYPD correction buses. Many have yet to be released. Reporting for BronxNet, Sanji Lopez. Thank you, Sanji. Well, protests around America have shown the inequality that Black Americans have faced for far too long. People of color have gathered together to the strength, I should say, to speak and the resilience to talk about the challenges as a direct result of institutional racism, whether it's housing discrimination, economic injustice, police brutality, employment, unemployment, barrier disparities in education, healthcare, and the list continues. Communities gather together to voice their concerns about the mistreatment that they actually face. The relationship between the police department and the community continues to be somewhat strained and things are in the process of being worked out. And when we say in the process of being worked out, yeah, it's a long road ahead. There's some challenges that are facing today's society. And so here to put some things in better context for us is pastor and also social justice advocate, uh, Ed Mulrain, who joins us now. And uh, good to have you, Pastor Ed Mulrain. It's good to have you and good to you continue to do what you're doing. Oh, thanks, hey, buddy. God bless your heart. Thanks, man. We're trying. We're trying to just you know raise the voice and raise some uh, raise some voices about awareness and social justice and social equity. But let's talk a little bit about it. I mean, uh, you've been out there, front lines uh, in the protest, front lines in raising your voice uh, in the aftermath of George Floyd's death. Um, first of all, your thoughts. Well, first of all, let, let's say we began this a long time ago when I was president of the NAACP Williams Bridge section. Uh, we started with Amadou Diallo and Eleanor Bumpers and Sean Bell. So this is not new to us. I think that um, I, I like what's going on in terms of the increasing protests from different uh, groups, from different cultures, from different voices, from young, from the older. And um, I think that uh, this one uh, with George Floyd really shows that the years of suppression and years of oppression and years of police officers that are um, use misconduct and violence and murder against uh, black lives uh, really have the, this is a tipping point right now. So I think that it's a good thing that's what's going on right now. And I think that it's even better that it's continuing and that in the midst of this changes are being made state to state, city to city, locality to locality. And I think this, we just have to keep it up. Yeah, we talk about social justice. Obviously, uh, it's on the mind of a lot of people now that word social justice but as you said you've been on the battlefield for a long for a long time but it now seems to be getting new life talk to us about the new life that social justice is receiving today I, I think that the new life is absolutely wonderful and the reason why it's so wonderful is because it says that it's not only affecting uh, black lives but it's affecting America when I when that officer took an oath to the United States Constitution to uphold life, liberty, and equal protection under the law. Um, he said something about what he would do. And when he broke that, when those officers broke that, uh, then they not only are they responsible for the murder of George Floyd, but America is responsible for the murder of George Floyd. And I think that why so many people are involved now, because they see this as an America problem. Uh, America problem that has not done anything about it, America problem that has allowed it to go unchallenged, uh, not put the necessary reform and policies in place. And then the energy is there, a new culture, new context uh, creates new uh, influences and new voices. So the voices that are out there right now are saying that this is a longstanding problem, 
it's affecting us. Um, the, those who are not black are saying that this is affecting our friends, this is affecting our relationships. There are more relationships between the cultures and the races now. I think that um, more people are seeing how this can tear down America. The racial problem has been a problem for a long time, but I think this new context, new culture, is showing how if we don't do something about this, uh, that, that this rising tide uh, voices will continue to go forward and continue to be just as aggressive as the um, as as the violence that's occurring against Black Lives. So I think that this is a great thing that's going on, and we must continue. And it's a new form of leadership. It's not just one person leading the charge. I mean, we had the Martin Luther King, we had the Frederick Douglasses, we had the Malcolm X. But I think this is a confluence of so many different voices coming together in different places. I mean, when you have places where there are no black people in Utah and Nevada and places like that and little towns and cities that are rising up as a result of George Floyd, this is a whole new culture, a whole new time. And I think Al Sharpton said it best when he said that, you know, at one time um, a, a white woman came to him and says um, that she hated him. And then now a little girl came to him and she said, black lives matter, little white girl. I think that this shows something about the times that we are in and that everybody is looking at it, uh, not, not from a liberal or conservative point, but as a human point. This is right. about humanity. This is about how you uh, deprive lives and how you deprive dignity and how you deprive uh, equal protection under the law. So we must continue this fight and we must continue it with um, the voices, the, uh, the various cultures and the various races in order to tear down um, uh, and not only reform, but deconstruct and then reconstruct something new. Yeah, we, we talk about having boots on the ground, right? And I think for you, uh, you've been a person with boots on the ground. I, you're the former head of the NAACP. Um, and when we talk about organizations like the NAACP, organizations like the National Action Network, uh, much can be said about we're not where we are today without the work of these organizations, the SCLC, to really get to a place of creating this awareness. Because um, yes, George Floyd was the tipping point, but long before that, organizations such as the NAACP and SCLC have long been raising their voice. That's right. I think it's an evolution, evolution of context, evolution of culture, and it's absolutely necessary that that evolution take place. And we must give credit to the um, uh, changes that have occurred under organizational leadership, NAACP, absolutely, since 1909, um, and, and NAN, uh, since um, way back and has been on the forefront of confronting many of these police misconduct issues before there were cameras, when we could not see it on cameras. I think the new culture has come along and cameras have taken the place in terms of civil rights, in terms of showing the actual um, uh, misconduct, the actual murder, and the actual beating. But prior to that, when there were no cameras, I mean, I'm thinking about Emmett Till right now, and they caught the picture of him. Um, and just imagine if we had had uh, video cameras back then where they not only caught a picture of him, but they also caught the beating and the drowning and uh, the white men on camera doing what they did. I think that this is, a, this is a time where we have to thank God for the past in terms of the organizations and their still existence, and then also embrace what was, what's going on right now uh, with the new collective voices that are out there in order to continue um, the role of social justice, the fight for freedom, the fight for um, um, exercising of freedom in this society, and the fight for humanity, the fight for black lives. Uh, these two organiza organizational and individual come together in order to tear down a destructive and wicked system. And when we talk about uh, destructing the system, that's because of protests. A lot of protests have actually caused a uh, deconstruction of the system. Uh, I know for yourself uh, that you got some things planned as well. Talk about what you got going on. Well, we already had a nice march right here and demonstration right here in Mount Vernon, New York. Um, and we're back in the days I did it in the Bronx, but now we're doing it in Mount Vernon. And um, we held our voices up and let the community know that the clergy and joined with clergy in order to let the community know that we needed uh, to join in solidarity with those who were condemning the violence and the murder of George Floyd. And so much clergy came out, the community came out, 
and we were able to voice our disapproval of, of the system, as well as shout out some changes that need to be made. You know, it's one thing to demonstrate, it's another thing to demand. Uh, Frederick Douglass said that power concedes nothing without demand. And so we demanded some things, which included uh, basically everything that Obama had written down in his eight points, that uh, the chokehold must be eliminated and outlawed, uh, uh, that cops should intervene with other cops, uh, uh, that we should do our best to eliminate 50A, which is going on right now. So there are some marches coming up on the 21st United uh, Baptist Coalition in White Plains, New York, as well as uh, one nationally that I'll be involved in with uh, Pastor John Green and uh, Mount Neva, the Ark of Justice. Um, and I think that will take place on Juneteenth in Washington, DC. And it's absolutely necessary that everybody be there in order to take part in it because we're going to go straight to where the policy, the source, and many times the opposition is. And that's in Washington, DC. Martin Luther King's statue is there. And at the other end, um, uh, President Trump is in the White House, two opposing factors, and we're on the side of justice. And so that's a big one that I think everybody should make note of and be involved in. Yeah. I've been asking all the guests on today's show to talk a little bit about um, the reform, the reform that's taking place by uh, Governor Cuomo that's put out there. You mentioned 50A. We know where 50A is right now. Uh, but in addition, uh, you know, the race, the race baiting calls, the, uh, you know, the things that are going on with regards to reform. Your thoughts on the governor's plan of reform? Uh, I know that things have passed, but uh, and it's waiting the governor's signature. But let me get your take. Yeah, I, I want to give the governor credit because he, at the end of the day, signs everything and approves it into law. But let's give also credit to Andrea Stewart Cousins, who's the head of the state senate, as well as Carl Heasty, who's the head of the assembly. I think they're putting together these bills along with their uh, faction uh, and consortium of members in order to make sure that these bills are written correctly and that they go forward to the governor. And I think the governor has been, I mean, I think he's been exceptional when it comes to COVID. I think he's been exceptional when it comes to these issues of race relations. And then he's been exceptional when it comes to uh, signing the bills that need to be signed in order for us to transform the system that is existing at the time. And that's what we want. We want a total deconstruction. I, I think that uh, more needs to be done. Uh, we, we need to keep it up. Um, we do need, the 50A has been passed. Um, I think some of the Obama uh, statements uh, need to be not only locally or statewide, but also national. When we talk about, they did the chokeholds, but when we talk about um, cops uh, being responsible or being intentional and intervening with other cops, I thank uh, God that what happened with the, um, George Floyd situation, and although Chauvin was on the neck of George Floyd, uh, there was also a cop who was on his back and another one on his leg, and another one who was standing there preventing the crowd from uh, getting anywhere close to what was going on. Cops need to intervene. Cops need, uh, we may need a law on that because if they don't, then they'll get into trouble. And that aiding and abetting, which the other cops were charged with, is a serious, um, uh, charge that must be stated and also implemented as a policy that if you do not get involved, you will face criminal charges of aiding and abetting. So I think that is everything so far is going well. Uh, we still have a long ways to go. I do not think this will be the last, uh, George Floyd will be the last death, but I do think that this is having the most impact. And they said in 60 years of any uh, protest that has gone on for a long time, and the changes that are being made under it also makes one happy and joyful that things can happen when people come together. But much more still needs to be done. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, final thoughts before we wrap up. Uh, give me your thoughts about, you know, what do you see happening in the near future? Well, what I see, this is what I said. I see, um, prophetically, I would say that I would say that something else is going to happen that's going to trigger uh, something that we missed out on that will give us an opportunity. I think that each event or each drastic or dramatic um, violent action that takes place, it's an opportunity for people to rise up, challenge it, and make the necessary transformative uh, structure, transformative actions to the structure that exists. So I think that stuff will happen again in the future. But I do think that we'll see uh, more restraint from police officers. 
I do think that we do have a lot of good officers and we'll see more of them rising up to be more interactive with the community. I do see them being uh, police officers being a little bit more uh, considerate of those who they come into contact with, whether it be in a car or whether it be in the streets, uh, as a result of what's going on right now. We see a lot where the racist police officers are rising up and doing certain things. And one thing I do want to say, I'm, I'm not too big on residency because I do think that uh, I have a brother who's a police officer and others who are police officers. Uh, but I do think that if we do more, at least 50 to 70 percent of police officers living in our community, that would be great. It, it would help out. It would uh, sound the bell for a new uh, structure and engagement, uh, and it would make us feel more like we're family rather than enemies. And so we should do more along those lines. But I do see things happening that are positive. I'm not one to uh, uphold the negative, but we do point out the negative. But I yeah. do see a lot more happening uh, that will transform the structure that exists currently. Yeah. Things are happening for the better. Ed Mulrain, thank you so much for coming and being thank with you. us and here. Everybody needs just edwardmulrain.com. They can sign up, put their email in, and get all the updated information of what we're doing. Make sure that people get connected. Ed Mulrain, of course, they have the information at the bottom of the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and being here with us. Thank you. And keep up the good work, Dan. Hey, bro, we're trying to. We're trying to. You do it. <laughs> thank you, bro. Thank you. All right. All, all right. right. Well, Take care. Well, listen, I want to let everybody know, listen, we have come to the end of our show today. I want to thank our guests for joining us and also you for watching as we talk about the Bronx Social Justice and Anti-Violence Forums. Now, if you want to rewatch this week's edition, all you got to do is go to bronxnet.org. You can catch the Reeve Cablecast here on Bronxnet TV. And also, you can also join in on the conversation, share your, you know, your perspectives and your information or via our social media pages. That's how you can do it uh, so you can stay connected to us. We encourage you to join us for next week's show. We're going to have more exciting guests as we elevate the discussion, bringing further awareness to social justice and anti-violence. For all of us here, I am Darren Jaime saying take care, God bless, and we'll talk to you soon. we're coming out of the other side. So in many ways, from my point of view, we're on the other side of the mountain. You have to be New York tough, smart, united, disciplined, loving. This is the next big step in this historic journey. We talk about being New York tough and what tough really means. We change the trajectory dramatically by what we did. What we have done thus far is really amazing. And that was smart, but we have to stay smart. In taking public transportation, don't touch your phone. Carry hand sanitizer and use it immediately upon leaving the bus or train. Avoid touching your face. If someone is coughing or sneezing, move away. Wash your hands with soap and water as soon as possible. Limit contact with poles. If possible, avoid rush hour. Don't eat or drink on public transportation. Keep your bag off the floor or other surfaces. Avoid directly touching turnstiles. Stay up to date with the latest from your local health department and CDC.